Hello and welcome. I'm Pooja Shali. We have a special telecast coming in right now. A lot is happening in West Asia. There appears to have been an escalation this morning coming in from what it was earlier a few days ago. The 1st of April, Iran is alleging that uh, their consulate was targeted in Syria. Then they fire missiles and drones toward Israel on the uh, 14th of April. And now... If the information that's coming in from different quarters is to be believed, a lot has happened on the ground. Take a look at these visuals. These are the latest visuals we are being told of Israel's attack directly toward Iran. Remember, Iran had uh, been able to, while hundreds of missiles and drones were fired toward Israeli territories, their sophisticated defense system had been able to intercept it, at least most of it, 90 to 90%, 95% we are told, and were able to break it down. But now, with Israel firing missiles and drones specifically toward Iran, and they have hit targets in Iran, are we looking at a wider conflict in the Middle East? Because remember, this regional conflict will not just be about West Asia, could actually turn into a global conflict. Israel has reportedly attacked Iran with missiles, and there is, there is very less clarity because no official information coming in. And very interestingly, while Israel doesn't have much to say, while Iran is trying to deny that there have been targets hit on its territory, but according to US media reports and US officials quoting, that Israeli missiles have hit targets and sites in Iran. But the officials are not confirming if uh, the targets have hit neighboring Iraq and Syria as well. In just a short while, we are going to put out a map for you to understand where these countries are located and how for Israel or Iran to hit at each other, they will have to go through the airspace of Syria and parts of Iraq. This happened the previous time when Iran was hitting towards Israel. But look, the visual images that we can confirm to you that the night sky that was lit up. In fact, this was early morning. Iran suspended flights over several cities. Why would Iran do that if there isn't an issue right now with the Iranian airspace and if something else of a conflict is brewing? Iranian government has moved several flights away from Isfahan. Isfahan is the main airport. That's where uh, the understanding that we are getting right now, and I'll go across to Ishwahan in just a short while. The attack came days after Iran launched that first ever attack on 13th of April. Remember, Tehran, we were told, launched about 300 missiles and drones on Israel. The Iranian strikes were in response to the first April Israeli strike on the Iranian embassy. So this is the latest that we are bringing to you. I want to immediately bring in a diplomat who has served in Iran, in Tehran, Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar, appreciate you always joining in, uh, Ambassador, because your perspective, not just with regard to your expertise, but what's been happening across the world, uh, definitely adds value to our telecast. I want to first immediately ask you the big questions, and that is with regard to Ishfahan that is coming. Now, it is believed to be Ishfahan at the airport area, that there are aircrafts there, it's a big target site. But if I'm correct, isn't Ishfahan also the place where there is suspected to be a nuclear training program of Iran? Because then it reaches and touches several other layers to this conflict, if it is hit. Yeah, thank you very much, Pooja, for having me on your show. You are very right. Uh, you know, Ishfahan is uh, the first capital of Iran. It is uh, an ancient civilizational uh, yes. heritage uh, city, 2,500 years old. Persepolis, you know, the former capital is located there. It is the roots of the uh, Persian dynasty there. In addition to, you know, what you mentioned about the uh, nuclear training program there, mm. the nuclear facility in Natanz mm. is located not far away from Isfahan. Now, I would imagine that, you know, if, uh, uh, again, as you said very correctly, right at the beginning, that we need much more clarity. Right now, yes. there are stray reports that are coming Agreed. in from you know, different media sources, etc. I don't think there is any uh, confirmed uh, information as to how many missiles, how many aircrafts, how many drones have come uh, and uh, fired here. Because I think uh, if Israel were to take that step of going out uh, 
uh, you know, to avenge mm. what it had to face uh, just a few days ago in terms of 320 missiles and drones and rockets and uh, ballistic and cruise missiles. Then, of course, the attack has to be very, very big. Mm. And, you know, so I think everyone would really be able to see. And it would not be only after a few aircrafts, uh, you know, in Isfahan, mm. that's a big aircraft base, etc. It will really have to be something very, very substantial and very, very significant. But uh, I think all of us are also aware that there has been huge pressure on uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and on Israel not to escalate the matters further, take uh, the success, as you also put it, that all the, you know, most of these uh, missiles and drones were shot in the air. And so many countries came to the assistance of Israel. It was not only Israel's uh, uh, Iron Dome, it was also the Americans, it was also the French, the British, and even the Jordanians who shot down many of the Iranian uh, drones and missiles over their own territory. Mm -hmm. So I think while earlier we were seeing in the Israel-Hamas context yes. that Israel was being isolated because of the manner in which it had con conducted that offensive against the Hamas in Gaza, after mm. this uh, Iranian attack on the 13th, 14th of April, mm. it was Iran which was find, finding itself uh, isolated. So, uh, but, I but think Ambassador it would have really taken... Hart, you're saying that uh, the world or even Israel wouldn't want this to escalate. But isn't this an escalation? When you're targeting territories directly and it looks like from what we have, look at that fireball that erupts when, when these missiles and drones have hit. This is an escalation already. Yeah, no, what I was saying is that the world would not want the escalation to take place. And definitely the United States would not uh, want an escalation to take place because that would be, uh, you know, termed as its failure. And it would be a huge setback to President Joe Biden as far as his re-election bid is concerned. As far as Israel is concerned, of course, it doesn't uh, listen to what the world is saying. We've seen that for the last six months in Gaza. It has pay, paid uh, scant attention mm. to what the Americans or what the others are saying as to how it should uh, conduct its, uh, uh, mm. you know, its uh, attack in, in Gaza. So Israel uh, is only concerned about what it feels are its own interests. And at the moment, uh, Puja, I would say mm. that if it wishes to retain the support of the United States, then I think it will have to listen uh, more carefully to what the U.S. is saying because, uh, you know, again, the re-election bid of uh, President Joe Biden is very closely linked and tied to what, uh, you know, how this conflict proceeds and that it should not escalate any further. Ambassador but Sanjana, this, as no, you no, say, I agree. The, yes. very, you, very you, rightly, that this, uh, if all these fireballs have come, mm. missiles have come from Israel, mm. then this is a definite escalation of the situation as it has prevailed so far. And who will take that step back? Will Iran say, OK, let's end it here, which is very unlikely because they have their own proxies, Hezbollah, to Hamas, to Houthis, who are constantly being after with a multi-pronged attack targeting Israel. The attack, remember, comes, and I request Ambassador to please stay on. This is after 13th of April, now that 19th of April. So within a week, from 1st of April, then 13th, and then 19th, there has been constant escalation. What do I know so far? As uh, we can confirm to you that there is no definite clarity. Both Israel and Iran are, for now, comparatively how they would speak earlier, a comparatively quieter for now. There are not precise confirmations coming in, but American media reports and American U.S. officials are speaking. And even though, via their sources, what we know so far is from Iran that the reports that are coming in, that three blasts were heard and near a military base in Iran. Fighter jets are located in northwest Ishwahan. Iran's semi-official force agency has reported. Defense is activated in response to an object that is likely to be a drone. So they are on the bench here. They are saying that something appears to have happened. We have activated our response, but we cannot add more. The target, according to, and we are told American media reports that I'm quoting here right now, who ha that have spoken to US officials, target is not clear, but there has been a target that has been hit in Iran. And we are told, again, this is close to a base of the armed forces of Iran. 
So tensions clearly for now are escalating. Israel, let me bring you now what Israel has said. Israel's military has said, we do not have a comment at this time. Now that is not how Israel usually responds. If you would have noticed ever since the uh, Hamas barbarism in Israel on the 7th of October, the Israeli spokespersons, officials, everyone has been on camera constantly putting out their views. Right now, they appear to be saying, we don't have a comment at this time. But there is definitely, as you can see, the visuals are very clear. From where are these drones and missiles coming in? They're not coming in from Syria and Iraq. According to America, they have called for a restraint from Israel in a bid to prevent a regional war. The U.S. has also added, they have been on the distance here. They have said, we did not give a green light here for this attack. Another official has told the CNN that I'm quoting right now. So America's news agencies have been reacting. The bigger question now is what happens next? What will be the ministers, uh, the Khomeini's, the ones at the top leadership of the Iranian powers? They will decide now what next happens. All of this, India is watching closely. Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar, I bring you in here. Ambassador, because India, like we have discussed earlier also, is friends with both Israel and Iran. So Israel, while has been our defense strategic partnership, has helped us at a time with weapons and ammunition when the USA or other countries have completely isolated us, did not want to help, they have come forward. They are suffering from terrorism like India does. But Iran and India have been century-old allies. We have been civilizational friends and now strategic partners as well. Indians are there in Israel and in Iran. What stand does India take at this moment? You know, when uh, Iran, uh, uh, Pooja, what you say is absolutely correct. Uh, you know, we have Indians there. We also have yes. strategic partnership with both these countries. Uh, we had uh, Prime Minister Modi visit uh, Iran in 2016, after which we gave a big push to the Chabaha project and to the International North-South Transport Corridor. Prime Minister Modi also visited Israel in 2017, the first Indian Prime Minister to visit uh, Israel after we established diplomatic relations in 1992. So both these countries are very important partners. And that is why India has expressed uh, a very serious concern at the possible escalation of uh, the hostilities between these two countries. We have uh, advised both of them to exercise uh, restraint. And uh, that is how we will work. Our uh, foreign minister has spoken, uh, external affairs minister has spoken to both his counterparts in Iran and Israel and has uh, counseled uh, restraint that uh, it should not be allowed to further uh, escalate. Iran has stated very clearly that even a minimal attack by Israel on Iran would be met with uh, much uh, more lethal uh, attack from uh, their side. They said earlier last time it was, uh, you know, it appears that it was basically for domestic consumption in uh, 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 Iran. And uh, so that is why it was not really able to uh, wreak much uh, havoc or damage as far as Israel is concerned. And they had provided apparently this intelligence through Saudi Arabia and through the UAE to both Israel as well as to the United States. Now, uh, if Israel were to attack, I'm putting an, a very big if here, because I think if uh, uh, Israel is to uh, attack uh, Iran, then it has to be a very visible attack, Puja, because I think we need to understand what Israel is seeking to gain by this escalation. Number one, what it would seek to gain first is that it would like to send out a very clear message to its adversaries that if any one of them dares to attack Israel, then they would be met with the full force of, uh, uh, of military power that uh, Israel has at its command. So it will not send out, uh, you know, 10 missiles, uh, 20 drones, etc. It will be a very, very strong, severe attack. So this is a strong message that it wants to send out uh, to the international community that, you know, you cannot uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, just uh, play with Israel and get away with it. You will have to bear the full brunt if you dare to confront uh, Israel. Secondly, the message will have to be to Iran that you have uh, done this from your own territory. For the first time Correct. you have attacked Israel, so you will have to 
bear the uh, cost of uh, the the manner in which you have gone forward thirdly it wants to send out a message to its own people you know it is still reading under this uh, uh, a complex that on the 7th of october the hamas uh, fighters could come in and could massacre 1200 israelis yes. uh, from uh, gaza hmm. and take away about 200 plus uh, hostages so it wants to send out a message to its domestic audience also that we are strong we continue to be strong mm. and no one can no power can take liberties with us so you know it uh, mm. i think israeli attack yes. as and when it comes it will be a very a full blooded attack rather than you know a few missiles here and there so you're saying basically this is more about uh, testing waters checking confrontation and not like a full scale attack because let's be honest here both iran and israel have strong ammunition strong weaponry with them their forces armed forces are extremely equipped so it's in many ways neither of these two countries are smaller weak nations and if they want to really go ahead with the escalation it could look terrible and of course the world wouldn't want it at this time prime minister narendra modi had said this is not an era for war i want to now bring in the map that our team has prepared for for you to understand where are these countries strategically located because this middle east mess remember could become a regional mess and in a globalized era as today as where we stand this is not about two or three countries that are at war this could engulf india included at this time even though of course we have kept our distance and both our friends iran and israel look where iran is located a fairly larger country and then there is iraq and syria that it needs to cross with these uh, missiles and drones that are fired at each other on the 13th of april that it was iran firing about 300 missiles and drones toward israel israel is that country located toward the sea in the corner a fairly smaller nation and is facing that multi pronged attack uh, whether it's the Hez- bola whether it's uh, the houthis or of course we have the hamas in in gaza but right now you see the sea in between these us jets that you that have contributed and are uh, saying that they have full fledged support to israel they had also decided to go ahead bomb parts of yemen where the houthi target sites are located but for now us has said in this issue in in this latest attack by israel we have not given a green light so you're looking at how where gaza strip is in the green and that yellow primarily is israel and when they fire they go from syria parts of iraq its airspace and then it hits iran This is a procedure that Syria and Iraq in many ways are also involved in right now and that is why this regional conflict remember could take larger proportions we are talking about remember about 10000 indians right now we are told live in iran and about uh, 4 to 5000 if i'm correct are in israel there could be more or less a uh, considering there have been troubling situations but this is largely the number that is in israel and iran uh, ambassador sajjan har at this point no advisory has gone out to leave the advisories have gone out to just be cautious uh, to keep your consulate and embassies in touch as well and as we look at how the situation is panning out i don't see india is very far of course there is the pakistan border pakistan territory but india will have to closely watch of what's happening at this point do you think let me ask you as a devil's advocate that should india militarily contribute either to israel or iran no i don't think so you know to respond to your question hmm. uh, i think it is very far fetched from our mind basically there have been other opportunities i think the last time that we sent our boots on the ground was basically to sri lanka in the ipkf hmm. otherwise i don't think we have or you know before that we had in 1988 operation cactus we had sent them to maldives hmm. but i don't think we are in the business of putting uh, sending our uh, military uh, personnel and hmm. as we have been discussing pooja also earlier both of them are very close friends very close allies hmm. and uh, i don't think we have uh, uh you know we favor either one of them or the other we favor peace and uh, tranquility in this area because uh, as you mentioned rightly you know we have about 10000 or mm. so of our indian nationals but it's also strategically very important i mm. briefly mentioned the chabahar and the international yes. north south transport corridor that is very important and uh, israel is uh, important we have uh, only mm. in uh, recent uh, years Hmm. we have the i2u2 platform that has been established hmm. uh, our uh, relations with the uh, uh, 
uh, Israel are uh, progressing uh, very strongly. We also have uh, recently at the G20 launched what is known as the IMEC, uh, that is the India, Middle East, Europe uh, 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 Economic Corridor. And that has uh, much, not only economic, but also geopolitical significance. So we definitely cannot uh, take sides as far as this uh, uh, conflict is concerned, because if this were to continue, Puja, in addition to, you know, if this were to escalate, in addition to what is happening in Israel and uh, uh, and uh, Iran, that we have to evacuate our people. We have, I think, uh, according to the information I have, it's about uh, 18, 20,000 of our workers, basically in terms of caretaking staff in uh, Israel. So getting them back, uh, that would, of course, be a challenge from a war zone. Mm. But if this were to escalate, then uh, whether it is uh, our uh, trade with this region, which mm. is very significant, if it is investment in this region, mm. our connectivity projects in this region, mm. our import of energy from this region, which is uh, also very, very high, whether it is uh, UAE or Kuwait yes. or uh, Saudi Arabia, and then, of course, our uh, Indian diaspora in this region, about uh, hmm. 8 uh, to 9 million people, about uh, 80 to 90 lakhs uh, of our people. And hmm. if they, they were to come under some sort of a threat, then that would be uh, uh, something that we will really have to uh, look at very closely. Ambassador and, Sajanar, uh, I want to just it. add here, uh, like you're mentioning, about 90 lakh people in total, Indians, live in the Gulf region. Uh, Iran, uh, India is, and India relies heavily on West Asia, specifically for oil. With oil, of course, comes in the energy security. That is very crucial. We have been able to keep ourselves Sorry, stable compared to the Western nations with regard to Russia-Ukraine war because we have taken that disca discounted oil from, uh, from uh, Russia. But here also at this time, uh, we are looking at a certain stability. And with India, that is Iran's fifth largest trade partner. We have a lot of treasuries coming in from there and we ship a lot of goods to Iran. So there's definitely a, a relationship that cannot be ignored, that cannot be sidelined at this point. But do you agree that this is not about Iran and Israel? This, this may be about their individual stronghold. Israel wants to say, we may be a smaller nation. We may be surrounded by, by nations that are constantly aiming at us. They want to annihilate Israel, but we'll fight back. Iran is saying we are the new leader of the Muslim world. We are the new leader of the, uh, of the Middle East. And if you hurt Gaza, we will stand by and we'll hit at you, Israel. Do you think it's also about these ego powers in the Middle East? Yeah, I think uh, Iran is trying to challenge uh, the uh, hegemony of uh, Saudi Arabia yes, and correct. the UAE because these are the most preeminent Muslim states and it has thought that you know if it were to take the Palestinian cause then it would be able to uh, you know ed, uh, uh, take its own leadership you know it would uh, be able to exercise its own leadership now let's uh, uh, you know this thing is very clear that uh, countries in the region want good relations with Israel we have seen this after the Abraham Accords you know after uh, four years whether it is the UAE, Bahrain, Egypt, uh, Jordan, of course, had earlier also. But uh, many countries want uh, uh, better relations with Israel. None of these countries wants conflict. That is why you would see, you know, what I had mentioned earlier, that as uh, Iran wanted the other countries to get involved in this fight with Israel, but none of them really wants to get uh, involved in a fight because they are all... Uh, prosperous countries by and large, and no one wants war. And you know, another thing, uh, Puja, in this yeah. is that if war were to take place, and we have seen that uh, about 20-23% yeah. of global energy comes out of the Strait of Hormuz. Just a few days ago, we saw one of the Israeli ships, MSC Ares, that was confiscated by Israel. And if shipping were to be affected from there, mm. if export of energy from there were to be affected, mm. it is going to cause lots of problems to the global economy, particularly to developing countries like India. Because we depend to the tune of about 85% of our requirements, energy requirements for imports and uh, uh, several of them come, you know, much of the imports come from uh, uh, the West Asian region. Of course, you mentioned about imports and discounted prices from uh, 
Russia, but yes. also from West Asia. I think we import more than about 40, 50 percent of our requirements. And the last point that I could mention here also is the remittances. You know, India is the largest recipient of remittances in the world, more than 100 billion dollars. And about 50 percent of that comes from this region. So it is uh, this region is very important. Stability, peace, security and tranquility mm. in this region is very important for us on a number of uh, parameters for a number of uh, reasons that we have just discussed. So India would be very uh, unhappy and very concerned and anxious if uh, this uh, stability were uh, to be uh, shaken as a result of this uh, escalation of the conflict. So yeah. as we are looking at these visuals coming in, remember the late early morning, late night, as you would like to call it, and just stay with the visuals right now. This is what has happened exactly about a few hours ago. I also want to take you through about what has been happening in the past two to three weeks. In the month of April, there has been a definite escalation between Israel and Iran. We look at uh, that report now about how April has been for the Middle East, for West Asia. Major escalation amid mounting tensions in West Asia. Explosions lit Israel's night sky and air raid sirens blared. We are closely monitoring Iranian killer drones that are en route to Israel sent by Iran. This is a severe and dangerous escalation. Our defensive and offensive capabilities are at the highest level of readiness ahead of this large-scale attack from Iran. Together with our partners, the Israel Defense Forces is operating at full force to defend the state of Israel and the people of Israel. As Iran launched hundreds of drones and missiles against Israel cities in an unprecedented attack, Israeli authorities have said more than 300 missiles and drones were fired by Iran but 99% of them were intercepted by Israel's state-of-the-art missile defense system. No major damage or fatalities have been reported on ground. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu chaired an emergency meeting. Netanyahu warned that Israel will hit back anyone trying to harm it. Citizens of Israel, in recent years, especially in recent weeks, Israel has been preparing for a direct attack by Iran. Our defensive systems are deployed. We are ready for any scenario, both defensively and offensively. The state of Israel is strong. The IDF is strong. The public is strong. We appreciate the U.S. standing alongside Israel, as well as the support of Britain, France and many other countries. They made a huge mistake yesterday and they believed that they had the ability and they, they launched an unprecedented attack, not only against Israel. In the history of humankind, there's never been such a level of missile attacks. It's much greater than anything even witnessed in uh, uh, the Ukraine over the past few years. And uh, they were utterly unsuccessful. Iran had vowed revenge since the April 1st airstrike on its embassy in Syria, which Tehran accused Israel of being responsible for. Israel hasn't commented on it. Israel has neither confirmed nor denied responsibility for the consulate attack. Iran asserted in its statement to the United Nations that the action was conducted in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense. West has strongly condemned Iran's attack. Backing Israel, U.S. President Joe Biden said that its support for Israel's security is ironclad.
Reacting to the latest developments, India has called for immediate de-escalation and exercise of restraint. India also vowed to help and rescue its citizens in conflict zone. It's obviously a matter of uh, deep concern uh, because uh, it represents an escalation in the situation uh, and uh, that is something uh, which obviously uh, is, is worries all of us because everybody, the entire world has stakes in that region. We have particular stakes uh, uh, in the region. With the latest escalation between Iran and Israel, will the world see another phase of hostilities between the two sworn enemies? Bureau Report, India Today. It's important to understand here also today amid this war that's ongoing, which is uh, giving signs of escalation, where does India stand and how India is viewed by these Middle East West Asian nations? Remember, you know, about a few days ago, there was a ship that was uh, seized by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. And they said that because this ship, even though it was of, uh, a, a, a belonged to a Portuguese owner, but it was, according to Iran, had connections to Israel and therefore they had seized it toward the Iranian territory. But on board of this ship were at least 17 crew members from India. While they are still with Iran, there have been assurances or statements that have come out that uh, we will ensure that they will be released just in time and that they are safe. Uh, External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jai Shankar had also spoken to Iranian Foreign Minister and had sent out a message that Indians should not be harmed on the ship. But amid all of this, there was a ray of hope. And I will put out that uh, image in just a short while, that a young cadet who was on that ship, we are told, has reached back home in Kerala, in Kochi, has been reunited with the family members. And that's one of the big steps. So that image on your screen, that young cadet was received by officials on the ground in Kerala. Uh, and uh, that, that smile clearly says a lot. And in many ways, this is how India's reputation seen with whether it's Iran, Israel, they may, may be at war with each other, remember, but they're also trying to ensure that Indian officials, Indian personnel are not harmed. But of course, this is just one step up uh, with more details coming in that seven are still in Iran now whether they are detained arrested in custody how they are being kept that clarity is not there but we are hopeful that it will not be just one but more and more crew and personnel will be released and they'll be heading back home so I want to bring in ambassador Ashok Sajanhar here do you think sir that whether it's years of building that relationship or with regard to the incumbent relationship we had with other countries and clearly a rise of India and economic stability a political powerhouse to be send, sending across a message that you do not and will not hurt Indians in your territory. Do you think that relationship also has a lot of significance? No, absolutely. You're very right, Pooja. I think uh, India's uh, clout, India's image, India's influence has grown very significantly over the last uh, many years, particularly over the last uh, decade. And, uh, you know, it is not only related to the uh, manner in which the Indian economy has performed. Uh, Ten years ago, India was the 10th or 11th largest economy. Today, it is the fifth largest economy. So its capacity to do good in the world has also increased. It is the fastest growing major economy. It will become the third largest economy in just about two, three years. By uh, It will become, today it is a $4 trillion economy. It will soon become, you know, uh, in the 2030s, it will become a $10 trillion economy. So all countries want to associate with India. But I think it also has, uh, India's uh, influence has grown in recent years because of the leadership that uh, Prime Minister Modi has provided by the rapport that uh, Prime Minister Modi personally, individually has been able to establish with the world leaders. You know, when we are talking of this region, Pooja, you would know that uh, all the major powers in this region, all major countries in this region have decorated Prime Minister Modi personally for... Uh, with their highest national awards for the huge impetus that uh, he has provided True. to relations uh, with those countries, mm. whether it is Saudi Arabia or it is UAE or it is Bahrain or it is Oman or mm. Egypt, you name it, all of them. Mm. And this, I think, is one of the great success stories of uh, Indian uh, foreign policy that uh, mm. while this region earlier used to look at India mm. through the Islamic Republic, uh, you know, mm. through the prism, of uh, the Islamic prism of uh, Pakistan that was it was advocated. Mm. Today, India has emerged as a partner of choice, as a consensus builder with all these countries. And that is why you see 
that even in MSC 80s, there are 17 uh, Indian uh, 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 crew members and uh, the Iranian foreign minister has said that no harm will come to them. They will be mm. provided with consular access mm. by our embassy personnel and mm. uh, they would be released after, you know, the normal mm. formalities are uh, concluded. So I think we can keep our fingers crossed and hope that very mm. soon this will take place. And we have seen this in other regions uh, yes. also. So this, uh, I'm sure, is uh, not only in this region of mm. Middle East or West Asia, but mm. uh, around the world. And we could see its uh, uh, execution, its implementation during mm. the G20 when all countries mm. came together to ensure that India's G20 presidency mm was a, a resounding success. Ambassador Sajunar, as I uh, look at yeah. these images of uh, Anteza Joseph, one of the crew members who has been released and she was received, what a moment, because we know how this went with Qatar. Even though the men were released, there was no clarity, no information. At one point, they were on a death row for some reason. Of course, it was the false charges. And when this individual as a diplomatic success is freed, and we will be praying and hopeful that all others, and if information is correct that Iran has said they will likely be released very soon, it is a it is a representation of how Indians are seen in other countries increasingly now and specifically with the diplomatic equation. So that's one visual that has at least brought some relief to Indians to know that there is some conversation that is happening. And as I wrap up Ambassador Sajjanhar, one question and usually that criticism that, you know, we see the surround sound, the discourse coming in with the protests against Israel, that Israel is the provocateur. It is Israel that goes after and shows aggression, creates trouble, even though Israel says we do it in self-defense. If we do not stand up today, there are multi-pronged attack and we will be annihilated in no time. Do you think that it is that 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 blame against Israel is fair or is this really about the situation on the ground that is just proving troublesome? Is it the Western nations uh, sort of pushing Israel toward, toward that bigger conflict? There are a lot, lot of conspiracy theories going on here. What do you think is really happening in this conflict? I think this is a very long history. It didn't start, uh, you know, on the... Uh, neither on the 1st of April, nor on 13th of April, Correct. nor on 7th of October, Correct. nor even before that. You can go to the Yom Kippur War in 1973. You can go to the Intifadas in 2006 or to the uh, Six-Day War, uh, you know, in 1967 or in 1956 or 1949 when Israel was formed. I think it is a very long history. And uh, so it uh, basically... All countries need to get together and ensure that uh, uh, there is a peace, there is stability, there is security, and there is justice that is done to the people in uh, the region. All these countries in the region, Puja, they have fought with uh, Israel in the past in all these wars that I have mentioned, 1956, 1949, 1967, 1973. And then they realized uh, with the Camp David Accords at the end of 1970s that uh, war is not the way to resolve this issue. And that is why you saw that Egypt established diplomatic relations with Israel. Subsequently, Jordan also established. And more recently, we have other countries also. Mm. Uh, so I think it is... Uh, the, unless there is a permanent solution, and India has advocated that, mm. a two-state solution to this uh, conflict that yes. uh, both Israel and Palestine can live side by side mm. in uh, uh, peace, in security, in tranquility <coughs> and uh, stability. You know, I don't think we'll be able to see uh, uh, this uh, an end to this uh, conflict. I don't agree with the fact that... Uh, uh, you know, the Western countries are egging on uh, Israel, giving it uh, weaponry, arms, equipment. I think Israel has been acting in self-defense uh, to maintain its, uh, you know, because the Jewish people have also been persecuted through the ages. And we know that it's not uh, one century or a few centuries. I think through the ages they have been persecuted. They also have a right to a land of their own. They also have a right to stability. And that is why, you know, on the 7th of October, India was very clear and categorical mm. that it was a terrorist attack by uh, Hamas mm. and Israel had all the right to go to 
try to uh, avenge its uh, this attack and to release the hostages. Yes. But after that, we also uh, uh, said that the manner of conducting this attack in Gaza by Israel was very inhumane. All mm. the international yes. necessary humanitarian international law needed to be followed. Mm. And we also sent out uh, aid and support to the refugees, to mm. the people who had been displaced mm. in uh, uh, Gaza. And uh, we have continued to uh, do that, support that, and mm. we have continued to promote mm. a two-nation uh, policy, a two-nation theory by which mm. peace can be and security and stability can be established in the region. Good and there is no doubt about the human suffering that uh, we're all witnessing still ongoing in Gaza specifically. But what we see right now, remember, only looks like that this is going to escalate to a much larger level. Can these countries come together, at least for now, to de-escalate? Or are we watching this telecast knowing that this perhaps could escalate in a manner that will engulf other nations as well? Not directly but in a lot of other issues, for example, energy security, and that will not be even a direct participation, but will strictly impact Indians at a much worse level. So let's hope diplomacy and dialogue come in the picture here. I appreciate you joining us. As always, Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar for your expertise and your views. I'm leaving you with these visuals. Continue to stay tuned because Iran and Israel will be our top story. It's the biggest international developing story right now. There are in the airspace of Iran and Israel via Syria and Iraq. Missiles, drones and fireworks that are being seen. Thank you for watching. Take care. Stay safe.